So we're continuing in our Rooted series, and the biblical tree for today is an apple tree. And throughout the ages, apples have played a pretty significant role in mythology and literature and language and even science. Astrophysicist Carl Sagan once said, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. I like that. Financier Bernard Baruch once said, millions saw the apple fall, but Newton was the only one who asked why. And uh, Pastor Robert Schuller once said, anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the number of apples in a seed. Isn't that an awesome quote? Apples show up in a multitude of pithy idioms like an apple a day keeps the doctor away. You're the apple of my eye. That's American as apple pie. How do you like them apples? It only takes one bad apple to spoil the, spoil the whole bunch. The apple doesn't fall far from the apple tree. Don't accept the apple cart. That's like comparing apples and oranges. Don't sow the apple of discord. I live in the big apple. Oh, yeah, I work at apples. So those are... <laughs> In mythology and literature, apples are often used as sensual uh, metaphors for love, uh, romance, eroticism, and seduction. In Greek mythology, the golden apple of Aphrodite, which is Venus uh, to the Romans, was a symbol of love, seduction, and fertility, and statues of this goddess often portray her holding an apple. In fact, Greek and Roman mythology have had such profound influence, unfortunately, on European Christianity that the apple eventually became blamed for being the forbidden fruit that Eve bit into, even though no particular fruit is ever mentioned in that Bible story. Robert Frost's symbolic poem, a poem after apple picking, describes picking apples as a metaphor for chasing human desires. And when Snow White bites into that poisoned apple, she immediately falls into a deep sleep. All looks hopeless until her true love kisses her and she awakens. Well, today's message is titled Rooted in God's Love and True to Its Metaphorical Form, we find a story in the Bible about a fruitful apple tree that provides an amazing intimate picture of God's love for us. So we're going to dive in right now uh, because i got a lot to cover, but let's pray first. If you pray with me, will you? Lord, we delight in looking at your incredible, fierce, reckless love that you have for each one of us. And I pray, Lord, first of all, that you'd be honored by the words that are used in this message and that somehow or another it would touch our hearts in such a way that we would experience the deep love that you have for us. And I pray that in Yeshua's name. Amen. So let's first look at the intimacy of God's love. The story is found in the Song of Songs, Shir HaSharim in Hebrew, but it's also sometimes called the Song of Solomon because it's presumed that King Solomon wrote it, even though he's not mentioned in the story. The Song of Songs uh, is an unabashedly sens sensuous, even at times quite erotic, triumphant song of praise to love. Throughout all of its eight short chapters, an unnamed young man, presumably King Solomon, and an unnamed woman pursue each other through fertile fields of valleys lush with flowers. And their excitement to be together is intensely sensual and captured in often very racy, poetic stanzas. The absolute sheer delight that this couple has for each other can't help but stir our own memories of love's intenseness and richness, especially when our lives were first touched by love's magic. Even today, betrothed Jewish couples standing under the wedding chuppah will say to each other the most famous lines from the Song of Songs, Ani li dodi, be dodi li, I am my beloved's, and my beloved's is mine, in anticipation of the life of loving partnership that lies in front of them. Unsurprisingly, because of its racy content, lasci lascivious nature, the Song of Songs was fiercely debated in the first century as to whether or not it was a divinely inspired book and should it be included in the Bible. Some Jewish sages back then argued for its inclusion, especially famous first century 
Rabbi Akiva, who viewed the Song of Songs as a metaphor or an extended allegory that uses the bantering, sensual exchange between these two lovers as a way to describe God's intimate love for Israel. And in the Mishnah, Rabbi Akiva is quoted as saying this. Listen, I love this. While all the sacred writings are holy, the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. Wow. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? While all the sacred writings are holy, the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. Another famous Jewish sage, Maimonides, asked the question, what is the proper form of the love of God? It is that he should love Adonai with a great, overpowering, fierce love as if he were lovesick for a woman and dwells on this constantly. And it is to this that Solomon refers allegorically when he says, for I am lovesick, that's Songs of Songs chapter 2 verse 5, for the whole of song is a parable on this theme. Some Jewish sages even take it further and describe the Song of Songs as the divine eros. Most Christians also agree that this is allegorical as well. But, you know, we should never lose sight that the Song of Songs is also an awesome portrayal of the spirited, sensual love between two real lovers. And so let's take a look at this text in the Song of Songs about an apple tree. It's found in chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, and here's what it says. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among young men. I delight to sit in his shade. And his fruit is sweet to my taste. He brought me to, you want me to say the banqueting table, but it doesn't say banqueting table. What it says, I'm sorry to disappoint you who love that song. You know, he brought me to the, it's literally the wine house, a place where wine is stored. Mm. And his banner over me was love. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. So the female lover in this, in the Song of Songs, is only described once as a Shulamite woman. Honestly, no one really knows what a Shulamite woman means. It's pretty much agreed that metaphorically she represents, she represents Israel in the text. And because of her ambiguity in the story, it's also widely agreed that she is most likely an ordinary, insignificant, inconspicuous woman who somehow catches the eye of the king. And if you remember, when God chose Israel to be the apple of his eye, he said to them in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7 through 8, the Lord did not set his affection on you and, cho and chose you because you were more numerous than, than the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loved you. In other words, God chose Israel not because there was anything special that made tiny Israel stand out from among all the other nations. In fact, as a world player, Israel was ordinary, insignificant, inconspicuous, but they caught God's eye and he chose them over all the other nations. And maybe you've learned by now that God always catches the eyes of those who are considered the least in society because they hold a special place in his heart. You hold a special place in God's heart. And so this common, insignificant, inconspicuous woman is fiercely and recklessly pursued by the king of Israel, and she's totally smitten that someone of such high esteem would even give her the time of day. And according to this text, she notices him because his fruitful love for her stands out boldly among the forest of fruitless trees. Picture a forest filled with bland, fruitless, green, and brown pine trees. And in the midst of them stands one beautiful, unique tree. And dangly from its branches are dozens of spectacular, colorful, delicious, juicy, sweet, red apples. It's a very striking picture. And notice how she's absolutely giddy and weak-kneed about the prospect of sitting in his shade and tasting his sweet fruit, mm. which should get us all start blushing at this point. 
And the plot gets even racier because we discover that all along in this text, she's been reflecting back on some previous intimate encounter where this young man took her into a room where wine is stored and something took place that proved his fierce, reckless love for her. A banner back then represented ownership, and so the banner of love is just another way of saying, Ani le dodi ve dodi li, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. And as this woman is reflecting back on this intimate encounter with her lover, she gets all verklempt, which in this case is Yiddish for hot and bothered. And she says, strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, I am faint with love. Oh my gosh. <laughs> She's really lovesick. Later on in chapter 8, she talks more about their encounters, but this time something intimate happens under a real apple tree, okay? Um, And the apple tree happens to be the very place where this man's mother conceived and gave birth to him, so maybe it's true that the apple really doesn't fall that far from the tree. (laughs) In chapter 8, verse 5 through 7, she says, Under the apple tree, I roused you. There your mother conceived you, and there she who was in labor gave you birth. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. The Hebrew word roused in this sentence literally means to awaken or to arouse, which makes me wonder, listen, makes me wonder metaphorically if at any time someone truly responds to God's love, does it awaken, does it arouse him in some way? In other words, does God get all giddy and weak in the knees and lovesick like we do? And I think based on this racy back and forth bantering between this man and woman, there's a better than good chance that he does. The Shulamite woman did something under that apple tree that awakened him in some way. And the big question I'm raising, does God display emotions consistent with romantic love? Is that provocative or what? Somebody after first service came up and said, that was the most scandalous presentation of the gospel I've ever heard. It was amazing. (laughs) I'm so glad he added that second part. (laughs) Think about this. We know it hurts God and that he becomes angry when we cheat on him, right? When we commit adultery with false gods, what the Bible calls sin. That's what the book of Hosea is all about. God tells this poor young Jewish man named Hosea to go out and marry a woman who will be unfaithful to him. And the crazy thing is that he does it. And his wife Gomer lives up to her unfaithfulness, not just once, but three times and conceives children from each of these adulterous affairs. And per Hosea is absolutely devastated. In the next chapter, God begins to cry out in deep, intense pain to let us know that this is how it feels when Israel cheats on him. And then he spends most of the chapter venting his anger. So we know that God displays wounded emotions that are consistent with someone who experiences the pain of unfaithfulness. But does God ever display emotions consistent with romantic love? Does he ever get all giddy and weak-kneed and verklempt when we express fierce, reckless love back to him? And wouldn't we expect that true intimacy necessitates a mutual response because doesn't the most basic definition of intimacy require that it takes two to tangle? Not tangle, tango. (laughs) I had to fix that. Freudian slip. (laughs) I don't want my mind to go there. Okay. (laughs) Picture a relationship where only one person in that relationship experiences intimacy. It, it, It can't happen because real intimacy requires a partner. 
And who is supposed to be our most intimate partner in the universe? Doesn't God refer to himself as our husband in the Bible? And aren't we called the bride of Messiah? And isn't there going to be an incredible marriage that happens in the eternal kingdom, the wedding feast of the Lamb? Am I making anyone nervous about where this is all going, by the way? Zephaniah 317, along with a few other passages in the Bible, gives a beautiful picture of what I believe is a giddy, weak knee, lovesick God. The prophet Zephaniah says in chapter 317, Adonai, your God, is right there with you as a mighty Savior. He will rejoice over you and be glad. He will be silent in his love. He will shout over you. I chose the complete Jewish Bible version for this text because I believe it, along with most of the other traditional Jewish translations, say it best and the most accurate way. Unfortunately, a lot of our Christian uh, translators, we're a lot, let me put it this way, we're a lot more prudish than our Jewish ancestors. They translate these verses, particularly in the Song of Songs, the way they're supposed to be. We get kind of a vanilla kind of a translation. So in this case, I chose this because it, it, it says it better. It starts with God is right there with us. I mean, you can't get more intimate than that. This is what God's after, right? Now the dwelling of God is with men. That's what the whole point of Revelation 21 is when we see heaven coming down. God is finally with us, and he's our God, and we're his people. He's our hero. He's our mighty savior. Who doesn't want to be married to a hero? And look what he does. It says he rejoices over us. That word rejoice literally means to spin around as a result of a violent or turbulent emotion. There's a couple words to rejoice in that, in that sentence, but one of them refers to this. And so tra some translations use the word dance, that God dances over us. Maybe you're familiar with that song. It's a little dated, but, you know, you dance over me, right? That's where this comes from. But it would, it would be more of a fervent, ecstatic kind of dancing. You see, you see this often. Uh, you see in Israel, you see Orthodox Jews dancing this way during festivals. They don't care if anyone's looking. They're not trying to be savvy or hip or precise. They're just lost in the joy of the Lord. And this is exactly the picture Zephaniah gives us of a God who is so lovesick with us that he's dancing ecstatically over us. And notice next it says that God is silent in his love, yet he's shouting over us with joy. How can you have both of those things? How can you be silent and shouting at the same time? It means that God is not going to be all rational and in his head with words and reasoning like, I love you. Yes, I love you. And I mean it. Right? That's not what he's doing. This is an incredible picture of God dancing ecstatically in total unrestrained zeal while shouting out totally uninhibited, jubilant, and joyful expressions of love all at the same time. This is simply raw, lovesick emotions at work. That's what he's doing over us. Read the text. Check it out. Intimacy is a two-way street. And we should never think that intimacy with God is only for ringing our bell. Because God gets so much out of his relationship with us that he delights. He, 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 he rejoices. He dances. He shouts with joy over us. That's how crazy in love God is with us. 
Okay, back to our text in Song of Songs chapter 8. While still sitting under the apple tree, after doing something to awaken her man, the Shulamite woman goes on to say, place a seal over my heart uh, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. A seal is like a banner. Same thing, which was a symbol of ownership, which means she's all in. She's 100% committed to this relationship. And then listen to what it says. For death, for love is as strong as death and jealousy unyielding as the grave. And you know, we, we spend a lot of time trying to delay death, don't we? I mean, we work out. I mean, these are good things. We work out, we eat healthy, we take supplements, but no matter how hard we try, one thing we can't do is avoid death or the grave because no one gets out of this life alive. There's absolutely nothing we can do to avoid our date with death. And in brilliantly comparing love to the unavoidable vice grip of death, this incredibly wise woman is saying, neither can we avoid our death, our date with God's love either. We can try, but we'll fail because God will never relent in his pursuit to win us over. Not until he has all of our heart. God has an insatiable appetite for you, for me, that burns in his heart like a mighty fire that cannot be quenched and no amount of water can put it out. That's how crazy mad in love God is with us. And this fierce, reckless kind of love that God has for us is what compels him to pursue us relentlessly. And it's all fueled by the intimacy of God's love. It's awesome. It's incredible. Okay, let's switch gears a little and finish up by looking at the experience of God. That was the intimacy of God. This is the experience of God's love. And by experience, I mean the heartfelt response that we should have because of God's fierce, reckless love for us. Romans 5, 5 through 8 says, Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, just at the right time, when we are still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Messiah Jesus died for us. Okay, and the worship team can uh, come up on the stage. We're going to just have just a couple minutes here in this, this point. The hope that Rabbi Saul is talking about here is the hope that we have that God's real. He is who he says he is. It's the hope that he will help us make it safely through this life. Even though we stumble, even though we, we feel pain, and a lot of life is like that. It's the hope that he will redeem all that pain and suffering that we experience. And that we will live for, with him forever in his perfect, eternal, messianic kingdom when he returns to establish it. That's our hope. And the reason why we won't, our hope won't be put to shame or disappointed is because God has given an outpouring of his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. This is something that we are supposed to feel in our heart, not rationalize in our head. God poured out his love into our hearts, not our heads, because this kind of love isn't something, it's not some kind of propositional truth. It isn't about reasoning and coming to a logical conclusion that God loves us. There are many passages in the Bible about love that are for our heads, but not this one. This one's for our hearts. God poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit because he wants us to feel his love. He wants us to experience his love. And that experiential kind of love only comes through the Holy Spirit, which God has given to all who believe. 
You're not going to get this kind of experiential love by, by reading your Bibles or by hanging out at church or by singing worship songs or forcing yourself to feel all mushy. Come on, we all do that. This kind of love only comes by the Holy Spirit which God has given us. And it's not just for touchy-feely kind of people. It's for every person of faith because every person of faith has been given the Holy Spirit. And it's also not connected to some intangible, vague, elusive, ambiguous source. It's rooted in God's love. A husband who is so crazy about us that even though we were cheating on him before, and even though we still cheat on him now, and even though we will continue to cheat on him in the future, he still left the comfort of heaven, gave up his life to save the marriage. Who gives up their life for an incurable cheater? That's what this passage is saying. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, while we are still sinners, and while we will continue to be sinners, Messiah Yeshua died for us. That's the kind of lover our God is. And we call it amazing grace. So I know many of you are probably feeling the outpouring of God's love in your heart right now. And there's some of you who are struggling with experiencing God's love. There's nothing I can do to switch that on for you or off for you. God has poured his love into your heart by, not by Gene Binder, not by Aaron, the worship team, by the Holy Spirit whom he has given you and so I've just created some space here in our time to let the Holy Spirit work I'm going to get out of the way and I know the worship team never wants to get in the way and we're just going to let God work let's stand up And honestly, just enjoy the next 15 minutes. And would you open yourself up to the reality that God is like a whirling dervish over you? Because he's so joyful, so jubilant, so excited. that you noticed him. It works both ways. And that's my prayer. Let's notice God's presence. He's with you. The Holy Spirit is here. Let's do it by reading what's on the screen here together. Let's do it three times together. Let's do, let's, let's do it now. God, you demonstrate your love for me in this. While I was still sinning, you died for me. Thank you for pouring your love into my heart through the Holy Spirit you have given me. Thank you for loving me even while I was cheating on you. Thank you for loving me even while I am still cheating on you. You're an awesome, forgiving lover. second time God you demonstrate your love for me in this while I was still sinning you died for me 
thank you for pouring your love into my heart through the Holy Spirit you have given me. Thank you for loving me even while I was cheating on you. Thank you for loving me even while I am still cheating on you. You're an awesome, forgiving lover, and I love you. One more time. God, you demonstrate your love for me in this. While I was still sinning, you died for me. Thank you for pouring your love into my heart through the Holy Spirit you have given me. Thank you for loving me even while I was cheating on you. Thank you for loving me even while I am still cheating on you. You're an awesome, forgiving lover.